the title of this panel is Governing PG&E and Corporate Climate Risk into the Future. So it was very clear last time that the issue is governance. Governance is an issue about what happens when some people make decisions and other people are impacted by those decisions. And um, it's ultimately about power and discretion. It's about information. It's about incentives. Uh, so good governance, and there is lots of different bodies here and lots of different people involved, it means that decision makers are trustworthy. They're probably properly accounted for their decisions. And that usually means that they have incentives to make decisions that are somehow uh, not causing undue harms to others and generally contribute to the common good. In the case of climate risks, uh, there are numerous decisions made by numerous people in many institutions about sources of energy, maintenance of equipment, land management, zoning, proactive risk mitigation by individuals, by businesses, by utilities, by the government, funding sources, and what happens when downside risk uh, materializes in natural disasters such as fires uh, and what, um, in general, uh, happens to when innocent people are harmed. Who gets the upside? How is the downside falling? Uh, all these things already came out. Is there justice? These are many, there are many decision makers, many decisions they are making, and some of which are very consequential. So that's um, what we're going to be discussing going forward, and we already saw that it's complicated. Um, so I'm a finance professor, and we don't have anyone with finance expertise, but finance came into the picture, and it's an investor-owned utility, so that's where finance comes in. So uh, some of the issues around the Bankruptcy in particular uh, came up. Um, as Dean Levin said too, pg and is a case of multiple governance failures that uh, we've become aware of more when climate risk showed us uh, the outcomes. So the way I saw it first in a completely different context was a financial crisis in which a lot of decisions made by lots of people ended up uh, causing a major implosion of the financial system, bailouts, and recession. And uh, again, it was sort of systemic financial institutions, and now it's a systemic essential uh, utility. So there are these uh, important institutions that uh, we somehow need to really uh, worry about. So from my perspective, I'll just comment very briefly uh, before I, I turn over to the panelists and introduce them, uh, is, is indeed the bankruptcy process. So it was mentioned that pg e filed for bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is a, a tool that corporations use, and it is a tool that can be abused and has been abused recently, especially in cases when, uh, when there are sort of other than investors in the room, like victims like Will Abrams in the room. And that was sort of the first time I thought pg e which obviously is a very rich case in terms of stakeholders, is a something that touches my expertise is has gone wrong. It's not even clear in the policy context, and there are going to be a lot of policy issues that we won't take here. It's not clear why this tool is even there for these companies uh, in the way that it's managed. So one of the things that Will and I have discussed when I first met him was he gave me a glimpse of that process. In a finance course in a business school, we just teach that bankruptcy means that the creditors take the firm, the shareholders go away, and that's the end of it. Well, that's not what happened here. Um, the, shareholders did, the shareholders did go away with huge profits. Uh, the ones that were there during the bankruptcy, other shareholders at, were there earlier and you know, under their you know, leadership or governance, Decisions were made that uh, not to maintain equipment, whatever. So uh, it was a process that ended up with something that just blew my mind when I first heard it, which is that the fire victims now own a quarter of the company, which from a perspective of a finance, that's just not where the risk should be going forward. Why is it that this process ended up in this way? Well, it's not a pretty story. So I can say, from my perspective, this outcome was unjust. That is clear and inefficient as well. 
Now the fire victims are still waiting and everybody else, meaning people who themselves are lawyers or who have good lawyers, um, came out ahead of this process. That is not okay by me. That's not good governance. All right, so I'm uh, moving to this panel. Uh, we have experts in a number of areas, and I will introduce them in a second, but just to say, because it already came up, that we're going to scratch the surface on the issues, because there are many more issues that indeed already came up. Michael Picker said, why are people allowed to live in certain areas? Why are people allowed to rebuild in certain areas? So housing. There's land management. We're not going to really discuss this too much. Controlled fires are an issue. Now, California committed to burning 400,000 acres a year or something like that, 400,000 acres every year by 2025 as a way to deal with fire risk because we've been fire averse and haven't allowed fires to clean um, the, the, the land. So there are there's much more to fire mitigation. Um, and to climate risk and all of that. Obviously, there are energy sources and, and, and issues like that will come up here. Okay, so the panelists. Uh, my co-organizer, Mike Vara, is going to start by giving us a little bit of an introduction of for this panel and overview of the issues. And uh, Michael, I introduced already, um, is the acting director of the Accelerator. He's a policy director at Woods Institute, senior fellow. Um, and I, I really enjoyed collaborating with him and his response for bringing a lot of these people who I didn't know before. Uh, next to Michael sits Mary Bell Badger, who followed Michael Picker in the PCUP. Uh, so she was there from August 2019 to December 2021, which includes much of the bankruptcy. Uh, Mary Bell has a long and storied history serving uh, in the federal government, in state government in Nevada and California, presidents and governors across the political spectrum, including Gavin Newsom, Jerry Brown, Arnold Schwarzenegger in California, Kenny Gwynn in Nevada, as well as private sector, including a two-year stint in the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, and she's now a consultant in a private company. And I would mention, she's probably going to bring it up, that unlike Michael Picker, who can say whatever he wants, uh, she still has a little bit of a cooling uh, period now where some things uh, she might not be able to say. So uh, usually we like kind of formers who, or in any way, people who can speak their minds as opposed to people who have some fiduciary to say certain things because that doesn't usually promote good discussions, which we want to have. Next to Maribel is Eric Borden, uh, Principal Associate of Synapse uh, Energy Economics. Eric uh, is an uh, energy industry uh, expert, joined them in to, uh, very recently. And the previous seven years or so, he was a senior energy expert at the utility reform network called TURN. So that's an organization that we um, considered inviting here. They're more of a consumer group, although he was there for as an energy analyst and an expert witness in a number of um, situations at, at, for the PCUP uh, and, and, uh, and other policymakers, including uh, electric vehicle infrastructure policy, distributed energy resources, rate design, wildfire safety, and other risk modeling and general use case. And uh, in particular today, we uh, and his experience also in, involves uh, stints in Germany and international renewable energy um, en energy agency. Uh, we're gonna want, uh, uh, and he will probably uh, Eric to talk about the undergrounding uh, idea in particular. Next to him, and uh, last but not least, is Nancy Watkins. Um, Nancy is uh, involved in. Uh, the insurance business as, as an actuary and an expert uh, on, on the risk, on predictive models for insurance risk, pricing and product development uh, for insurance, use of catastrophe models, loss reverse and uh, reserve analysis, reinsurance risk and transfer market analysis, and more. And most recently, she was an author of uh, uh, a uh, study or paper on catastrophic models for fire for wildfire mitigation, which went to uh, examine different uh, ways in which uh, individuals can uh, can engage in fire mitigation, such as uh, 
fireproof roof and things like that and how that would affect, say, insurance rates because insurability is an issue. And uh, sure enough, if you, know, you can't get ut utilities to come or you can't get insurance, you, know, you can't get a mortgage, you can't uh, live in that, in that area. So, so that's, that's a piece of it, uh, of the economics of it, that, that is really in our face, the cost of insurance, the cost of energy, uh, all of these. So um, I'm going to start by turning over to Michael uh, to give us uh, a little bit of an overview. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anat. And I'll just say it's been such a pleasure to plan this with you and to get to know you. I was a huge fan of yours and your work regarding the Great Recession. And it's been really exciting to build the relationship and build the relationship between the new school and the business school. Um, and I hope it continues to flourish. Um, deciding or figuring out how to manage an electric utility like PG&E in a context in which we actually live and in which that company operates is not simple. And I don't think there's a clear right answer. Um, for me, this problem really began um, in, you know, as soon as the Napa Sonoma fires had occurred in 2017. And I began to understand a little bit about the implications of the loss that had just occurred, the devastation that had been wrought on people's lives, and also the financial liabilities that had been created, essentially for, you know, most likely, frankly, for California ratepayers. That 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 whether we liked it or not, one way or another, California was going to pay for this loss. And that had, in my mind, immediately huge implications in two ways. One was for low-income people in California who already struggle to pay their electricity bills, struggle during the extreme heat events like we had this September to afford to leave their air conditioning on because they know that that might mean they can't buy groceries at the end of the month. Um, there's already, I, I saw a, a friend of mine who works on these issues recently shared data. I think there's something like three and a half million ratepayers in California that are behind on their utility bills. Realize there's only th like 13 million houses in California. That's a lot of ratepayers who can't pay their bill on time. Um, and so affordability is, was, and is a huge issue. And the creation of these liabilities that ratepayers might ultimately have to face was a primary concern. A secondary concern was that California, and the reason I got involved in fire, frankly, was that California is a leader in the clean energy transition. And that, as, as, as Michael Picker mentioned, that is predicated on credit-worthy counterparties that can sign long-term contracts. Renewable power plants are built based, you know, when a power purchase agreement is signed between the product developer and the utility, and then the product developer can take that agreement to a bank and get project finance to build the, build the facility. If we don't have a credit-worthy counterparty on the other side of that contract, there's no solar that's getting built in the Mojave or in the Westlands Water District or wherever. Um, and so those two issues for me, you know, really leading with the affordability concern and, and secondarily the clean energy transition that we all want to see happen, um, led me into this space. And um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, first and foremost. You know, I, I'm an energy lawyer and an air pollution lawyer. And at, at some point long ago, I took contracts from uh, a woman named Barbara Freed, who's still at our law school. Um, and you know, one of the things that Barbara kind of hammered into me was uh, that um, you know, one, the job of a lawyer when they're negotiating a contract, when they're in a transaction or, or in a contractual negotiation, is to allocate risk. Right? That's what lawyers, good lawyers do. And ideally, you know, in a perfect world, you want to allocate the risk to the parties that have the most ability to efficiently manage that risk. That's going to create the most value for everyone. Now, in California, we have a situation where Judicial, judicially made law, right? 
around inverse condemnation has allocated risk in a particular direction. And it's, it's allocated the risk to the utilities for all losses that occur associated with the fires that they ignite. And I think the political reality of the situation is that's not changing anytime soon. And you know why? Because the utilities burn down communities and they kill people. And if you are an elected representative in the state of California, you do not want to vote for any legislation that is going to reduce liability for people that burn down towns and kill people and make lots of money doing it. That's like a non-starter. So the question then is, OK, is the utility the right risk manager? Do they have the capacity to manage this risk or not? If not, what do we do? And I think the response of the legislature you know, at the time was to say, what we need to do is create a system that sort of tries to manage that risk, even though we can't actually reallocate it. Um, and that's really a lot of where 1054 and the wildfire fund came from. They're highly imperfect. I would be the first to admit that. Um, but that's what we're really trying to do. And the question, you know, one question I have, and this has really led me into a broader examination of issues related to wildfire, is whether utilities, even the electricity system, is a place where they can actually manage this risk. And I think Commissioner Picker, Michael, Michael was, was, was um, you know, referencing this as well as, you know, referencing land use questions. You know, there's some sense in which the wildfire problem we have in California is one in which you know, gasoline has been poured on the ground and we're dropping matches. And if you drop a match where there's not gasoline, you get lucky, you put the fire out. If you drop the match where there is gasoline, you're going to burn down a community. And the question is whether the person who drops the match is liable or we need to manage where the gasoline is more effectively. And I think the, the real truth is we need to do both. We're not doing both terribly effectively right now. But I think there's also, so, so that's one set of issues that I think are worth thinking about as we think about the governance of the utilities and the governance of the wildfire problem in California. The second issue, though, really is directly related to the utilities. And this is to ask whether, you know, and we, we talked about this to some degree during the, during the bankruptcy, that, you know, and I was a part of that in some sense. I was a consultant for the Senate. I was a wildfire commissioner before that. Um, during this whole process, and so I was involved, indirectly anyway, um, not as involved as some of the people I'm sitting next to or the people on the first panel, for sure. Um, but I think there is this, this legitimate question to ask, and especially to ask now, in retrospect, where you know the bankruptcy occurred, and part of the challenge in the bankruptcy, and I remember this vividly, was you know, that, that June deadline had something to do with fire season, right? It's an unusual situation where you have a large bankrupt corporation that is bankrupt because of committing torts, right? That be, because it is acting in a way that is negligent, perhaps grossly negligent. And during the pendency of the bankruptcy, it is still committing those torts. And there is no way to stop it because it's, the torts are a part of it providing an essential service to society. Right? So this is a unique situation where we have, you know, in a normal case, if a, if, if a company commits those kinds of acts, it would shut down and the assets of the company would be liquidated, liquidated and hopefully the victims would get something and a lot of the other creditors would get maybe cents on the dollar. Right? But we can't shut down our electric utilities. We need electric service. It keeps people alive. And as we've encountered public safety power shutoffs, with greater frequency. We've seen that vividly in the PSPS context, but I think we also see it in the extreme heat context in California at this point, where we need air conditioning in the Central Valley at certain points in time and in other places in California too. And, and so we cannot have, we cannot do without this kind of company. Um, the, so, but, but there's an important question here I think that's, that's worth asking that you know, whether the, the level of risk that the company needs to bear, or the entity providing electric service needs to bear, is really compatible with private ownership that can be compensated at a rate of return that is allowable, that's politically allowable. And I do think that there are real questions there. I was particularly intrigued uh, by Judge Alsup, 
who is a, someone we tried to get on these panels, but he has, still has some peripheral, in, peripheral involvement with, talk about somebody who will say things you're not expecting people to say about this issue. Um, but Judge Alsop has some involvement in this process still, and so he could not come. But you know, he said something that I thought was insightful um, at a certain point, which was that the, in his final order in the, um, his oversight of PG&E's um, probation, um, which was that maybe the real solution here is to keep the urban parts of PG&E's service territory as investor-owned utilities but to municipalize the rural parts, to take the, the, the wildfire risk that exists in the rural parts of California onto the state balance sheet. Now that would create enormous headaches for the state of California, to be sure. And just imagine if California had municipalized PG&E as a part of bankruptcy, then the Dixie fire, the Kincaid fire, the Mosquito fire, which thank God it rained in September this year, right? I mean, that was like, barreling right toward North Lake Tahoe, and it rained. Thank goodness. Um, but you know, all, you know, all of those fires would have been something that landed on Governor Newsom's desk quite directly. And I think that's not something that any governor really wants. Um, but there's a real challenge, right? Which is that we are, we are struggling to operate a utility that can invest adequately to actually remedy the problems of the last century, of you know, the, the problems of neglecting maintenance, but also the problems that we're confronting um, because of our forest management and because of our pattern of patterns of development, which as was pointed out, the utility is obligated to serve under long-standing precedent. Um, so I would just say at the outset, I, I think this question about public ownership particularly for the parts of the system that generate the risk and the costs that are very hard to bear is really undecided. But, you know, the, 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 but I think there's sort of this broader question, and I would emphasize this, that we really do need to think about this risk holistically and to think beyond just the utility system. And if we can do that, there's enough capital and enough cost potentially to manage it well. Um, enough and, and enough assets to manage it well that are worth protecting. Um, the, you know, in closing, I think the, the, the last thing I'd say about governance is that the, I would agree with what was said on the prior panel. It's hard to violently agree with something that's already been said, but you know, that, that, that ultimately this comes down to incentives. I am actually a skeptic about performance-based rate making. I think the history of performance-based rate making is not actually that great when you look at it. California is one example where it's been really hard to, to do performance-based rate making around energy efficiency. We have tried, and we have done a pretty good job, but there's plenty of reasonable people who would say that the utilities game the system successfully, and, and we're rewarded for not doing that much. And if you look back at other examples of performance-based rate making, you see similar kinds of questions coming up. So it's not simple to do well. Um, and, and I'm, I'm a skeptic that we could really do it well, that we could get enough information to do it well. It really is an information problem. Um, but I'm a huge believer in the leadership of investor-owned utilities facing the consequences of their actions. That if we can't get the information we need to regulate, then we need to create incentives that create long-run consequences for those, that management and the board and so, you know, when I actually, when I, when I think about this, my, my, my favorite um, examples of creating those kinds of incentives involve very long vesting schedules for compensation that the utility management gets. That way, whatever the CEO of whatever utility does this year is going to affect their long run wealth because their stock won't vest for a very long period of time. That creates a ton of risk for them. And, and, and frankly, in the current context, I think recruitment of management and the board is an issue, right? Like, and, and that's something else to keep in mind. Like, there's so many trade offs in this space. If we create incentives that create so much risk for the corporate uh, management, we won't be able to hire the best people to come run our utilities. But I think the trade off is worth it. I think there are good examples of that kind of incentive structure that have been created within corporations, and I, I would continue to 
say that we need to move in that direction because it's so hard to get the information we need about what decisions are really matter within an organization as large as PG&E or the other investor and utilities. I'm going to shut up and <laughs> let the panel start. But, yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Mary Bell to uh, offer some thoughts, some comments, what, what you, you've heard, the topic of this panel. I'm sure you have plenty to say, even, dis even despite your cooling off. Cooling off. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's really an honor to, to have been invited on this panel, even though I am still in the cooling off period. And I think the previous panel was extremely interesting, and I agreed with most of what was said. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, I do agree that the, the current structure is certainly, in terms of a, of a public investor-owned utility, is certainly not perfect. But um, it's sort of, sort of like a democracy, and, and um, it's, it's perfect until you or it's not so perfect until you look at all the rest of, of the governing um, styles. I can't, I'm slaughtering the Churchill quote, but at any rate, um, the, the fact of the matter is, um, going forward, um, we still have some terrible maintenance issues. We still have some tough equipment issues. We still have, yes, um, the uh, a tremendous amount of people living in the tier three wildfire danger areas in California. Um, we still have all of these issues. And, and do you want to be the ratepayer that owns it and the taxpayer that owns it? Um, if, if it were indeed to go into the Golden State Energy um, uh, uh, Department or whatever we would call it, that's the name in the legislation, as Will Abrams commented about. So, um, it's certainly not perfect, and, and there are certainly many things we can do to improve it. But um, flipping that switch is, is not easy. I don't agree with what Judge Alsop said. I don't think that, I don't even know how you do that, frankly. But um, yeah, then, then the state would, would be on the hook for the worst and the most difficult and the most costly parts of, of the, and the most difficult to maintain areas of the PG&E service territory. So I also think that going forward um, with, as uh, was said in the previous panel, as climate change bears down upon us ever so, so vigorously, um, more, more quickly than we have had planned, the scientists had said, and certainly more quickly than government can react to it and regulators can regulate and and, and react to it. Um, the cost of wildfire mitigation is huge. Caroline Thomas Jacobs, who runs, uh, Mr. Picker, President Picker um, pointed her out, um, runs the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety, now was um, head of the wildfire safety division at, or the wildfire division at um, the CPUC. Another, just a little offshoot real quickly, another thing that 10, AB 1054 did that was not, in my opinion, very wise, it set up a structure, a governmental entity at one place, the CPUC, and two years in the, in the legislation moved it to the resource agency. Very complicated and I think not wise way to govern. If, it, if they wanted it in resources, by God, they just set it up in resources. At any rate, that made for some difficulties, but we got through it well. Um, the wildfire mitigation costs are absolutely unsustainable. Unsustainable. I'm going to quote, Caroline, correct me, but when we first put the water, wildfire mitigation plans together, again, instructed under 1054, the three investor-owned utilities together was going to be about $5 billion, and that's over a three-year three period. The cost in this last year of wildfire mitigation, around $24 billion. And who pays for that? The ratepayers pay for that. Yes, the federal government in the infrastructure bill, there's some money going to be flowing into to the state, thankfully. And yes, there are some general fund dollars that Governor Newsom put in the budget last year and again this year. But this is unsustainable, and, and it's a huge issue that, that um, we have to figure out. And, and if it's not a change in how we do rates, 
at, at the CPUC. If indeed it's not performance-based rate setting, rate making, I'm not necessarily, I'm sort of agnostic about it, but, um, or, or if it's not some other way of funding. But this can't continue, but we have to continue doing vegetation management. We have to continue with the different types of, of mitigations that are both statutorily mandated as well as regulatory mandated. So um, I, unfortunately, I popped out um, a pessimist. <laughs> this job wasn't very, very easy for me to have as a pessimist. But these, we have some really tough sledding ahead of us. And I'll end on that wonderful note. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Eric, uh, please tell us uh, how you see things from your angle. Um, well, I appreciate that both of my co-panelists brought up affordability and brought up um, how unsustainable the expenditures are. And, and I hope that that's something that we can all agree on. And I want to make the argument today that I, I totally sympathize with like why people are saying, well, the problem before was this profit motive. Get rid of the profit motive and you solve the problem. But I think for those of us who have looked into this more deeply, and I believe the Churchill quote is, um, uh, democracy is the worst form of government other than all the other ones, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, it's like, Thank you. this is, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I actually think it's a good example because at the end of the day, it's, this is us running it. And who do you think, um, if, if we were to municipalize, say, say PG&E, who do you think is running that company? Well, it probably looks a lot like the same utility staff and the CPUC regulators who already today have full regulatory authority over PG&E. So I don't see it as the, the magic bullet that, um, that it seems to be at least at first blush. When you've, and, and when you've been involved in this industry longer, you see examples where it went well and you see examples where it went terribly. Um, so, you know, I, 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 but again, I really appreciate that, we, that we're starting off with affordability and I want to make the argument today that we have all the tools necessary to make this work. And I'm not going to pretend like it's simple, but I think I can hopefully lay out some ideas for where, what makes the most sense based on all the data analysis that I've done over the last several years, uh, both at pg and &E and the other utilities. Um, I do want to add on to what uh, Michael said about affordability and why it matters. Um, the first is climate change, as Michael mentioned, but there's another reason why keeping rates affordable uh, is key for climate change, and that is um, our, one of our, the main ways that we'll uh, reach our climate change goals in this state is through electrification, electrifying transport and electrifying appliances. If rates get too high, I mean, forget it, right? And as Michael said, California really is a leader on climate change. We've influenced how the rest of the United States and the world have been able to at least make some progress on it. Um, at the rate we're going, we will no longer be a leader on climate change because people will not be willing to electrify with electric rates of 35 cents, 30, 35, 40 cents a kilowatt hour, right? So like, we can't uh, not solve our climate change problems and then say, well, because of climate change, we have to increase rates. It doesn't make any sense. The second reason is it's important to keep in mind. So California has the number one poverty rate in the country when you account for cost of living. Um, it, it, now, the main reason for that is, of course, housing. I think we all know that. We all feel it. No matter what your income bracket is, you feel housing. But electricity and energy is actually the most regressive way to tax people to get funding from people. It hits lower income hardest. And those low income people are already hit the hardest. And in fact, those are the people who are leaving California. So that's not like really the society I think that we want to be headed towards. And again, I do think there are solutions here. I'm not saying that they're simple, but there are ways that we can solve this problem both and have both affordable and safe energy. All right. Nancy, you didn't talk about the undergrounding yet. Oh, I thought I was supposed to get to that later. Oh, okay. I'll do that later, next, next round, yeah. next round. Okay. Yes, because we do have a round or two to go. 
Nancy, please. Um, thanks. I, I, uh, I think I might be the odd person out in the room, <laughs> but just because I'm not really a, a, a PG&E person or a corporate liability expert. I'm, I'm an actuary. Um, and, and so what that means, what my job is, is uh, it's all about risk. Um, figuring out what risk means in a given context, how to quantify it, and where it goes. So m most of my work is uh, in markets where property insurance availability and affordability are issues. So catastrophic risk like flood and hurricanes and like wildfire. That's, that's how I got into wildfire. Um, so what I've been doing is uh, I, I lead Milliman's, uh, my, my company's a, a worldwide consulting firm, and I, I started our Global Climate Resilience Initiative with the thought that climate change is giving us new, uh, new risks that nobody's ever seen before that will never, ever be dealt with properly unless we start talking across the silos of information that exist. And those silos worked just fine for so many years for so many uh, purposes. But now people who've made decisions and, and, uh, and, and relied on structures that um, historically were adequate uh, or even um, desirable have to look at the future through like a, you know, those 3D glasses that you wear in, in, uh, in the movies, something like that that lets us see the future without so much of a tie to the past. And so that's where actuaries to the rescue, <laughs> hashtag, um, <laughs> comes in. We, uh, I mean, we uh, sort of obscure people are suddenly finding that every discussion about climate change eventually gets to risk. And Michael got there pretty fast. Um, it, it eventually gets to risk, like who, who owns it and, and how much is it and what are we going to do about it. So wildfire is really tricky, um, more so than hurricanes and floods, because fires can be started by people or, or um, non-natural causes. I think the statistic is something like 85% of wildfires, something in that range. Um, are human caused, and that's very different than a hurricane. Um, the other thing about wildfires is that people can stop them. Um, you, you, you can't really stop a flood. You can move the water around. Um, you can't really stop a hurricane, but, but um, fire uh, protection personnel can uh, minimize or, or stop a fire. Um, so that, that is uh, good, um, but it also makes it very hard to model. So from, from a risk measurement perspective um, and from a risk mitigation perspective, we, a lot of our focus today has been on ignition. Um, ignition, the, the human or the, 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 the utility caused fires. Um, but when you're thinking about mitigation, you need to be thinking um, about the ways, um, and, and we have touched on vegetation a little bit and home hardening. Um, but you need to think about the ways to prepare the environment um, for when the ignitions happen, as well as to reduce the ignitions, and then prepare the fire service professionals to be as equipped as possible with resources and information and be able to stop the fires more um, early in their, in their uh spread so that they're not overrun, so that we don't have the campfire situation. Um, that is very, very different, and, and it's, um, it's actually good news. So, so, so sometimes there's good news <laughs> buried in the bad news um, that uh, we don't really know very much about urban conflagration right now. One of the reasons that we've been caught so flat-footed in California is that what happened in 2017 and 2018 had never happened before. Um, the, the, um, the, the, from an insurance industry perspective, um, you know, the, the risks that they had modeled and, and the way that they had handled the risks um, were, were, there was a whole new view of the risk after those couple of years of fires. Um, so I have been, um, I'm, I'm on the CAL FIRE Risk Modeling Advisory Work Group. I'm working with the Western Fire Chiefs Association. 
We are working with the town of Paradise to figure out how to rebuild, to um, maximize their chances of long-term property insurance availability, um, how to make their, like, how to align the buildings so they're less likely to burn each other down, um, what home hardening techniques are the most effective, um, how to build in long-term financing to keep their vegetation management in place rather than just have it happen once and then it's, it goes, you know, all to, to pot for the next year. So um, th through all these discussions, and, and we, we actually held a, um, a, an all-day session here at Stanford. Michael was our moderator. We brought in uh, fire scientists, uh, fire chiefs, actuaries, um, insurance product people, and catastrophe modelers. And we just talked about what are the obstacles to, to understanding fire risk and to understanding what are the most um, effective ways to reduce fire risk. So through those discussions, everybody learned something. You know, everybody found out that there was something someone else knew that they didn't know, or there was something someone needed that they thought was already worked out. Um, one of the things that I found out was that fire spread models, they're all based on forests. But when you get, this is another weird thing about fires, is houses, the thing that you're worried about protecting, all of a sudden turn into fuel. And the fuel is, uh, it's, it, that, that um, process, is not well modeled. The, 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 the best models are n not very good. And so the, the big dollars and, and the big loss of life and, and the, the communities that are, that are level to the ground, those things are not well understood by anybody. Um, so that's bad news. But the good news is we can do better. And so the, the question is how to divert our resources, how to put people together um, to, to do better. And um, one of the things that I'm working with the Western Fire Chiefs on is an open source um, wildfire mitigation database where um, the, in, the, the, the insurance industry is right now, maybe if, if they're quoting a, a policy in your community, they send somebody to your house and that, that inspector looks at your house and records proprietary information about your um, your home hardening and your vegetation around your house. Um, but that, that information just goes into the insurance company system and then it never goes anywhere else. Um, if you want three quotes, that's three people coming to your house. Um, they looked at your house, but they didn't look at your neighbors and the neighbors next door to them. The, the, the neighborhood is a bigger source of risk than your own house. So the information that they were capturing wasn't even the information that they needed. So this is a huge solve that is not that hard. The insurance industry has a great handle on what kind of data they need. The cap modelers have a good handle on what data they don't have. Um, there are lots of different ways to collect this data. Some of it can happen with drones and airplanes and artificial intelligence and all that hoodoo. But some of it has to be a person walking around a house. And it has to be current, and it has to be comprehensive, it has to be aggregatable, so that um, you, you, we're, we're looking at everybody's risk using common data elements. And for, for me, the deal breaker is it has to be free to the policyholder we have to, or the homeowner. We have to know who, uh, when was my um, home looked at, uh, what, like getting your credit report. What, what was the answer um, in the zero to five foot clearance around my house? What did you say um, that, that I was clear or that I had vegetation? Did you, did you know that we put ember screens on um, last year? Do you know that we enclosed our eaves? Did we got rid of a fence? Are, are, are these things known to the insurance companies? We might not understand their fancy, fancy models and how they came up with their risk cores and how their pricing um, goes through in, into the, the insurance premiums. And that's OK. That's pretty much the way insurance works for every other peril, um, not just wildfire. There's, there's a lot of proprietary information around risk measurement. And that's good for competition. But measuring what is, that should not be an estimate that I can't get access to. And we don't want to spend hundreds of dollars for each house 
to figure out what is and then make that non-transparent and non-aggregatable. So this, this uh, I, I just was at an industry conference on uh, Tuesday uh, presenting this with uh, a fire chief from Orinda, which is our town. And the Western Fire Chiefs is all in on this. Um, we're so, sort of going and, and trying to get volunteers to come and, um, and start help, helping feed this idea. But if we have the data um, within the communities, we will have a better way of modeling community risk, which is a big, um, uh, it's a big uh, step in the direction of mitigating community risk. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, this is just one thing that we're working on, but um, there's going to be lots of trade-offs in this discussion. You know, we're going to be looking at uh, affordable housing and the freedom to live wherever we want versus should we really be re rebuilding homes in the WUI um, and uh, affordable insurance versus uh, an insurance industry that's healthy and um, and actually showing people how much it's costing for them to live where they want to live and have those beautiful um, manzanitas touching their house, um, or salvia in our case. Um, so the, 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 my thing is uh, that there should be things that we agree on. There's, there's, there's a, um, a lot of disagreement and there's a lots of, of trade-offs, but I think what we should agree on is that the it's not good enough um, to just argue over who owns the risk. Um, we have to actually do a better job measuring the risk and try to come up with a common language. Um, we will need um, to drive the risk down. We, there's, uh, through the risk uh, ignition reduction, which y'all have really got a lot of good ideas on, and through some of the things I'm talking about, if you can disrupt the fire before it gets too far into the town, you've saved the town. You might have lost five houses, but you won't lose a thousand houses. Um, and so the need for innovation to do this and, and, and really the need for us to work together and, um, and, and have these complex discussions rather than looking for simple solves. Thank you. So that's, that was the first, the great first round. We heard a lot. I think one theme that we have, even from the last uh, panel, and certainly something I'm very passionate about, is sort of siloed thinking and, si and sort of fragmentation of institutions as a way to sort of not solve uh, problems that we can do better solving. So this came up repeatedly about what information we have to to know what to do, um, how do decision makers get their information? Do you get the information out of the financial statements of the company, or you know, from the risk, from the sort of approval process, the PC, CPUC, or you know, from insurance adjusters, uh, and where does it go, and how is it used? So uh, maybe you can comment on it, sort of any mix of. You know, Nancy already did some of that, but it's like, okay, where should, who should know more about what, and how should expertise flow through the system? Because one of the things that I've watched as well is, is a siloing in academia, and that is sort of what what we're trying to also overcome, is that we don't talk to one another enough, and so complicated things like this are kind of dealt with in various places, but not ever people talking to one another um, as much. So maybe you have some thoughts about that issue of, of the fragmentation of knowledge and the fragmentation of institutions and how the, sort of overcoming that problem would, would help. Easy question. Um, so, you know, one thing I would say is that uh, to, to follow up on what what Nancy concluded with is that we have done a lot of work in the state of California trying to understand ignition risk and how to avoid it. Um, and what's interesting to me, and, and, and in parallel to that, there's other parts of state government, and, and Caroline is here, and she runs that operation for the state government, and the utilities invest a lot of money in trying to convince the agency that 
uh, Caroline Thomas Jacobs runs that they're doing the right thing and spending their money in the right way. Um, there's other parts of state government that do the other side, the left of bang, as the firefighters like to call it. The, 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 the stuff, you know, what can we do to, to mitigate the risk of fire in the landscape and for structures and for communities, and once it, assuming that ignitions will occur. And the reality is they do, right? Lightning strikes happen. People are stupid uh, in terms of putting out their campfire, right? That, that was, seems like it maybe was the cause of the Caldor fire. Um, and sometimes utilities light fires because they have uninsulated wires all over the landscape. Um, and so I think a place where we need to do much better integration as a state and as a society is getting the expertise that's happening in the utility space to talk to the fire and landscape management agency, the land managers. And we need to, I, I think we need to port some of the expertise that we've worked so hard to develop within the utility space into those other arenas so that we can better balance our spending and investment. Um, that's a hard problem. It, it may create accountability in places that aren't used to it. That's particularly challenging. Um, that would be one place where I think we need to do better information sharing is across those silos. And I think that's true here, too, at the university. Right? One of the things I try to do in my research is bring the electrical engineers into the same space as the fire scientists. Right? And those two groups need to work together. Um, because, and usually they don't. Um, and, and that's, I think, a, an area where there's a lot of opportunity um, to do better. And because I'm a big believer, you know, when we finished with the Wildfire Fund, one of the intuitions, Carla Peterman was the chair of that commission. I was a partner with her in writing the chapter of the idea that became 1054, like it or not. Um, and, but we both agreed at the end of this, this is crazy. We're buying a $21 billion insurance policy for the utilities of the state of California. Shouldn't we do more to reduce the risk? Shouldn't we be spending approximately that much money at least to try to reduce the risk if we're willing to spend that much on insurance? And the reality is the utilities are spending a lot of, they're spending a lot of our money, as has been pointed out, but the state is not doing as much. And, and, and it's, it's doing a lot. It's doing more than it ever has. It's doing more than any other state does. But we also have a lot more to lose than any other state. And so I think connecting those information flows is incredibly important to making progress. Well, um, silos in all of the places I've worked <laughs> and have been, uh, Silos are always the problem, it seems, and breaking them down is not easy. Just like what was mentioned earlier, cultural change is very difficult to uh, manage, incentivize, and implement. Um, some of the things that, that go to um, probably climate change management and keeping the lights on um, is, is work, the, the entities that are in, that control um, those things in state government, the CPUC, the California Energy Commission, and then um, Cal ISO that runs the market. And um, we, I know that President Pickard tried and I tried very hard to keep a very, very close relationship going and almost day to day uh, work with um, the three entities so that we were sharing lots of information. Our staffs were sharing information and <laughs> hopefully getting along well in the sharing of that information. And um, same is true about the Office of Emergency Services, OES, and CAL FIRE. We're very closely on uh, welfare mitigation efforts as well as getting a, a piece of this puzzle we haven't talked about um, I think President Picker mentioned it briefly about how telco lines can also um, uh, have ignition problems. But getting the telecommunication community talking to the utility community and back and forth, that was a huge problem with some of the um, early on and still, frankly, some of the power shutoffs, the PSPSs. 
Um, so now that's not going necessarily to the larger picture. It's more down in the weed kind of picture. But it's extremely important um, that we were sharing information. We were talking to each other. When Caroline left um, the uh, CPUC and went over to the resources agency under the, the instruction <laughs> put forth by 1054, that caused a problem. At, it further siloed us in terms of sharing um, the information, the wildfire mitigation plans, and there's still some approval that was just messy in how we do it. But we worked hard to stay in close contact with each other um, because also very important, her um, in, within, um, her mo within her mitigation plans, they do some wonderful risk management and risk, I mean, not management, risk modeling that she um, devised with her team. And it really is extremely important. They are measuring risk. Um, and they're doing it very well within the, the wildfire mitigation plans. But, um, and I'm talking really uh, very rather bureaucratically here about the kinds of silos that we have to continue as, as the president and the leadership uh, in the entities that have something to do with keeping the white lights on, keeping the fires from not burning down towns and killing people. Um, we have to talk all the time. And it's easy for us to, because um, sometimes we're competing. And, but we also are very dependent from a structural perspective uh, on each other, as well as just in terms of uh, information sharing. So that's something that I worked hard to do, and it's extremely important. Can I talk about risk modeling really quick? Um, so just to demystify a little bit, although maybe this won't help, um, the mathematical formula for risk is likelihood times consequence. So the probability of something happening times the co consequence when that thing happens. Um, and what we do at the PUC and with the utilities is we look at the section of the likelihood part, so the probability of an ignition from utility equipment, and then we basically ignore, like what Nancy said was right, like we kind of ignore, like we assume the consequence happened and, it, and actually the risk model we do it assumes the worst consequence, so we're probably overestimating, but that's okay. Um, but we don't look at like, home hardening for consequence. We don't look at some of the other things, and we pretend like they're not related, but they're directly related. It's just a multiplication of those two things. Um, so it's, it, it kind of doesn't make any sense from a holistic like societal perspective, how do you solve the problem or minimize risks from wildfires? Um, and just to give an example of why that becomes somewhat absurd is, I did a blog on this just because I was like curious. Like, I wanted to compare how much are utilities spending versus the state. Okay, so I looked at 2020, I think, and I found the IOUs, just the IOUs, spent double what the state, through mostly through Cal Fire, spent on both proactive mitigation measures and fighting fires suppression. Double. So from a risk perspective, you're like that kind of makes no sense, you know. Um, so the silos issue is huge, and it's something that, I don't know if it leads, needs a legislative fix, but there, there needs to be, like, and I will also say the risk modeling that um, has developed at the PUC has gotten so much better. Um, the sophistication, the data, now you wouldn't know it from the utilities proposals, and I'll get to that later, but the, the risk modeling itself is, so much better, and, and as an analyst, it's so much, it's, it's been great because before the utilities would just come in and say, um, this thing is bad, we need a lot of money, but they wouldn't really like quantify, well, is it that bad or this? And now we actually have a lot more data to work with, and that's huge for, particularly for the interveners. Again, I, the utilities don't really use it in their proposals. I mean, that's just how it is, I think. Um, it's pretty clear when you look at what their proposals are that they're not actually using it, but it's there for others to use and certainly would be a huge resource to the rest of the state to like combine efforts and say, how do we actually tackle this problem? 
Yeah, um, I, I want to thank Eric for not giving us any Greek symbols in his formula. <laughs> Sorry, I, I would have had that. to leave. I, you know, that's that's a deal breaker for me. Um, but uh, no, I, I think the risk modeling. Um, I mean, not to geek out on on this, but it's it's really the issue. Um, like because you have to have models um, to project what might happen in the future, and the whole problem with climate risk is is you can't just look at the past and and extrapolate it in a simple fashion there's so many complex high uh, impact downstream consequences the second variable in your formula um, the consequences that can happen um, if you know different scenarios happen that you have to actually be able to um, to show that in something that that is called a model so that, in answer to your question, um, how could expertise flow through the system, I would say a much greater attention to models, what they are, what they do, how you understand, how you evaluate a model, um, not just the need for models, because models are only as good as the people who um, are evaluating the inputs and the outputs of the model and figuring out what they mean in a given context. They're, they're just a tool. They're not magic. They're not the answer. They're not the eight ball. Um, but, uh, but that whole skill set is not, there's, there's, even in the insurance industry, there's a skill set around modeling. There are no standards for evaluating catastrophe models. There is no standard setting body that says, this is how you do it. We're creating courses to teach people how to do it because the courses don't exist. And we, we do it for insurance departments, for FEMA. Um, but that's not enough. You know, you don't, you want your own people internally for all these big agencies to have this kind of expertise and to be kind of humble about it and, and to be talking to others um, and getting better and better at, at, at using the models and, and, and linking up people who are good in other agencies. Um, and I, I really want to talk to Caroline. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that's where I think that uh, the expertise could flow through in a, in a meaningful way. Okay, so I want to bring it a little bit back where we don't have a huge amount of time because I want to give some, a little bit of time for, for audience question. But as we talk about expertise, and you know, I'm an expert, I'm writing mathematical models with Greek letters and all that, uh, and the models just have a lot of assumptions, so all of that, but really, in the end, it's about people in the public uh, who get their information from, you know, television and 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 from politicians and etc. And what was described in the last panel about you know hearings in Sacramento and who's coming to speak and who gets their voice. So that's why I, you know I think that ultimately sort of the battle for what the public believes and what the public knows is really also important, which again, I think where academics often fail. We here, we had two journalists in the last panel, uh, and you, we really, at Cassie, love investigative reporters and bring them frequently to campus, which academics is, you know, our low low life relative to our fancy schmancy methods, but uh, but it's important to to communicate to the public. And the question is, who does that? So that's why I wanted Eric to talk about undergrounding because if you turn on a television, and I don't watch much television, but it's hard to avoid those ads. Uh, that uh, the CEO of PG&E uh, announced. Uh, without even consulting with a lot of people in the company, that they will, that this is the future. And we uh, are going to put all these um, towers uh, and cables underground. And now please uh, make a, help us do that. It's a big capital expenditure, which they like to do. And, uh, you know, who's looking at that? Who's explaining to the public, you know, what the ads is saying, what a lobbyist would say versus what's going on in an unconflicted, accessible way? So that's why I wanted you to talk to that. Um, yeah, and I'm, I don't live in pg and &E service territory anymore, but a, a former colleague sent me the commercial, uh, and that's what I used to get psyched up for this panel. It is... Um, <laughs> it, 
if if you were to watch that commercial, you would think this is already happening. I mean, it's done. And so what you should understand about that is this is PR. I mean, this is classic corporate PR. And what they're doing is putting, and I have to say it's like pretty smart PR. Um, they're putting pressure on the PUC. They have a proposal before the PUC right now to begin this 10,000 miles of undergrounding and starting with 3,300 miles of it. So that's before the commission. If I were a regulator looking at that commercial, I mean, I'd be curious what you say, I'd be so pissed at PG&E <laughs> for creating this public perception that this is happening and that it's easy, okay? So in case it's not clear, I'll give you my opinion on the proposal. Um, <laughs> Uh, this will be the magic unicorn of like uh, wildfire mitigation solutions. It sounds great. It's, you know, you think, it, like when you watch the commercial, it's like, yeah, you just throw the lines underground and, and you're done. Um, it's, here's why it doesn't make any sense. And here's why PG&E's own risk modeling shows it doesn't make any sense. The first is that it's just too expensive. As I said, um, Affordability has to be a consideration. Frankly, there are only finite resources anyway. Um, this is an undergrounding first strategy that maybe you've heard different numbers, maybe you've heard it cost 20 billion, 30 billion. Those should be alarming. In reality, it costs more like 100 billion because they're not including all the costs of profit and debt and taxes and all those things that you're actually paying for on your utility bill. So you're not gonna hear that number from PG&E, but um, that would be the number if even using their lower cost assumptions. Um, and it's actually more expensive than you think for other reasons, maybe I'll get to that. The second reason why it doesn't make any sense is it just takes too long. Um, there's a reason why PG&E has on average only undergrounded 22 miles per year. Um, it's very complex, it's, it's not, um, digging a trench next to all these lines and putting the cables underground. There's soils management. There's getting huge equipment into, into um, forested areas. There's personnel. There's removing the poles. There's what do we do with the telecommunications equipment? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just, so it's, it's a really, it's a strong PR strategy. Um, I worry very much about the politics of this because, again, and one of the reasons I emphasize affordability starting out is that affordability is really the can that always gets kicked down the road. It's like, uh, we'll deal with this you know, next time um, or in some other proceeding um, because of the pressure that they could get put under um, to do these, these magical sounding things that, like, yes, if we could start over and start with an underground system, totally. Um, but for those reasons, doesn't make any sense. I do have ideas about what they should be doing because I don't just want to be the no guy. So that, that's, um, that's where we're going. And I, you know, okay. I, I, I needed you to get this through only to also make the point that who's speaking and who's being heard is always there. And we just have to be uh, aware of that when we hear information, who says it and what is yeah. it that their incentives are to say it. Uh, it's hard for the public to always discern. Um, and, and, and that's, that's a big problem. I've seen it certainly in banking. Lots of nonsense gets, sounds reasonable, but is bullshit. And, then, <laughs> and, and in this case, how would the public discern? Because, I mean, the PUC is constrained. They can't come out and say, pg &E, shut up. Like, we're, we're evaluating <laughs> it. We'll do it later. Like, it, that's just like, they don't really yeah, do so that. I can't, I can't so, as a citizen, I can't parse you know, this ad. Yeah, no way. I can, you know, write a book called The Banker's New Clothes and unpack what bankers are saying or even regulators in banking uh, and what's right and not uh, and try to teach the journalists and the politicians something. But so that's what needs to be done in other domains as well where ultimately if it's a political problem, the public needs to understand what's going on. So now we go to a final quick round before we go to questions and answers. Yes, yes, yes. So we, we, you can okay. do it. We'll just go one okay. more round okay. across all of you. Um, just say, saying one or two priorities if you were, you know, to change, to be positive. So Eric, you'll get and get your chance, but let's go down the line again. 
long-term incentives for the management plus much greater coordination and investment in fire mitigation strategies that will allow us to tolerate fire in the environment as opposed to pretend like we can eliminate it from the environment. Um, top priority, how, uh, figuring out how the heck do we pay for wildfire mitigation as ratepayers and as taxpayers. I'm just Oh, I'll comment. You asked, what did I think of the ad? And did it piss oh, me off? Yeah. Or did it, it, yeah. No, it, it, there was something about those ads, and many of you maybe have not even seen the ad we're talking about. It's the one with Patty Poppy talking about uh, undergrounding. But part of the ad that really irritated me is, is her, I can't remember the exact words in the ads, even though I've seen them so many times. But she sort of talks about them being the community, your community, PG&E, you, your community they utility. And, and yeah, I know the magic. <laughs> but, but that sort of irritated me a but lot more. But if you were a regulator, I would, I, I would ignore that. No, would? it wouldn't even, okay. it wouldn't even phase me. It okay. really wouldn't. I mean, there's, there's going to be a procedure. There's going to be a process. There's a general rate case. You know, um, you kind of also have to say, okay, for PG&E, and it's not just undergrounding. They're doing veg. They're doing. It's not a single thing that well, they're doing. Their proposal is to spend ten billion dollars on undergrounding. Oh, I in this understand. Year. And, okay, and how saying. much are they spending on wildfire mitigation? Ten billion. Yeah, it's equal. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. so exactly. Yeah. and they are doing some some covered conductors as well. Um, Edison is is throwing all the all their money at um, hardening and doing the covered conduct covered conductors, which are basically covering the the electrical lines, and and um, so it's it, it's it's who they they embrace one thing. I don't think Patty Poppy's embraced entirely undergrounding, but for parts of their territory, yeah, she's she's mixing it up. But I know the ad does imply that. That Whoa, she's going to okay. take I, care of everything by undergrounding. She announced ten thousand miles of underground. Yeah, and she That's and a, as as Anat said, we didn't know anything about that. Nobody uh, knew anything no, about it. She no. just had a little press conference out in the forest and said it. And it's like, holy <laughs> crap, what is she doing? <laughs> so. So by the way, I I dug. Well, I'll add this to my undergrounding critique. I dug into like where that proposal came from, and she basically had, as as I could find like one day long meeting with a bunch of engineers where they kind of threw out ideas and they you know talked then they talked about undergrounding and then she came out with came out with that and so you know what the PUC will be looking at is is this really prudent. just and reasonable prudent. and prudent to do this so we I can stop on undergrounding it's back to the earlier point I made I was on a site visit with PG&E uh, looking at undergrounding in Grizzly Flats, which is an area that was totally eliminated from the map by the Calder fire. And the undergrounding there, my ballpark estimate is they said they're going to underground about 30 miles of line. So call it, you know, 30 miles times $2 million or so a, a mile. That's about $60 million. The fuels management project that would have saved Grizzly Flats that the Forest Service never did because they never got the money and they never got around to it, $12 million. That's the difference that I'm talking about, where we really need to be thinking across silos. Let's just emphasize the United States Forest Service. Yeah, federal government, right? Yeah. This, is, this is not just California. But it would be cheaper for California to pay the Forest Service to do that. <laughs> yeah, so when I first started doing testimony on wildfire stuff, I, I like wanted to talk about prescribed burns. It's like when you read the literature, uh, it's the academics um, across the board is like prescribed burns is one of the best ways to deal with the consequence of wildfires. And you know, my attorneys would be like, "Well, what is the PUC going to do with that? Like, you can't even talk about this." And and that's just the silos problem that that we're dealing with. Um, so, all right, I don't have like two. I've I have a five-point Elizabeth Warren, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren type uh, plan for how to deal with this. Um, and he persisted. <laughs> so, all right. So between 2015 and 2020, PG&E ignited nine like large, basically catastrophic wildfires. One of them being the Camp Fire, the most infamous, infamous one. But there were eight others. Okay, every single one of those was found to be 
the result of a lack of compliance with state law, either vegetation management, not removing or trimming trees right, or equipment inspection and, and maintenance. So 100% of the large wildfires were due to this, this one reason. So step, step one here is, I'll call back to, back to basics. Um, this is something I learned from Catherine Blunt's book. After San Bruno, a, a pg and &E CEO comes in named Tony Early, and what they realized was they hadn't kept up with maintenance on their gas infrastructure. He called his solution to it back to basics, back to the fundamentals of running a safe utility. That's where pg and &E, um, as step one needs to go. And that's why this 10,000 miles of undergrounding concerns me because they're shifting so much focus over to this one solution. And again, it's, it's, and I'll get to this in a second, undergrounding may work in some situations. It's not that it's, but in terms of like taking just half your district and undergrounding it, it doesn't make sense. So first one back to basis, second, cover conductor, um, Marybelle just mentioned it. So this is thicker insulated wire that can go up in high threat fire districts that doesn't completely solve, but significantly reduces ignition risk from vegetation, um, as well as from certain types of equipment, particularly from conductors coming together or falling down. Um, it's actually, and, and it's much cheaper and quicker than undergrounding. So is it 100%? No, but it's, it's probably, it's very high, we think, um, and we're still collecting data, but it makes a lot more sense in terms of getting a lot of risk reduction quickly. The third is undergrounding itself. Um, like, again, the 10,000 mile thing doesn't work, but you will have very high risk areas, particularly with climate change, where you just can't have power lines anymore. And so, you, so just doing a much more targeted approach makes more sense. The fourth, and this is very controversial in California, is power shutoffs. Um, I know that we all think about power shutoffs as in 2019 when they just said, let's shut off the power to basically the whole grid. They were in bankruptcy. They, they way overdid it. I mean, I've looked at data on what actual wind speeds are in different places. It didn't make sense, but they were being super careful because any ignition would have, um, would have uh, po possibly like just eliminated their franchise. Um, and so, you know, but going forward, there will be times when um, we have to do some amount of power shutoffs, but doing it well and doing it targeted. And um, just so I don't say all negative things about pg and &E today, like they've gotten way better at it. When you look at how much better that they're targeting, partially because of political blowback from 2019, but they, so and you are, yes, and <laughs> I remember you yelling at them, that was great. Um, Unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, um, they've gotten way better at it. Like when you look at data on like the number of customers, restoration times have gotten much better and they can still make improvements. So that will be part of it. And the fifth, and this might be equally important as step one, is a really robust um, independent regulation. I know we've talked a lot about pg and &E today, but the PUC has such a massive role here, and in particular, third-party verification of what is actually going on there. The best data that I've gotten about PG&E in the last years has been from the Federal Monitor, which was appointed in, in after San Bruno, but then did, <coughs> did uh, wildfire stuff. They've pointed out all the problems. The PUC and Wildfire Safety Division and OAIS have to continue to do that, bring that to interveners, and the PUC, and then the PUC has to be really independent-minded, look at facts, and make the hard calls when they need to. Nancy, very quick. Sorry. Can um, you do, can well, you yeah, do I, fast? So, because I, I have a quick thing to say, and then I do want to get a couple of questions in. I talk fast for a Southerner. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think my, my wish is uh, increased reliance on science and experts for decision-making, um, and taking a clear-eyed view of risk. I, I'd love to see, and, and I think the media helps a lot with this, um, more uh, courage uh, from political and corporate leaders to face up to the bad news, even when it hurts, even when it causes them problems. Um, I mean, I think about, like, in the ocean, when there's a big wave coming at you, the worst thing to do is turn your back to it and, or, or, or you know, start running away. I mean, you just got to run right to it and dive into it, and that's the only way you're, you might get creamed anyway, but uh, you might actually live to come out the other side. Okay, so I, I just want to uh, say one thing here. I had my, my own little list, but I just want to tie back that just 
we got another mention of that monitor, and we got a couple of mentions of Judge Elsop. So the case was about uh, the 2010 fire, and uh, just as Will was mentioning last time, the probation for the case where a gas pipe exploded in San Bruno and killed eight people. This is not climate change now. This is fiji and &E equipment. The case was resolved in 2017. The company was uh, guilty by a jury uh, of, uh, of crimes, some, you know, part of the accounts, and paid $3 million, so this is not corporate accountability, $3 million and a five-year probation. The probation went through the entire bankruptcy process and out the other side ended this year. And Judge Elsop, that's the judge we tried to get here and couldn't, is an author of a quote in the description of this event saying, pg and &E is a menace to California. Oh. We tried to rehabilitate pg and &E, a criminal corporation, and we failed. So just, and then now we're hearing that the monitor that was doing the probation, meaning somebody, an outsider from the federal government looking at this company and finding things is a source of information for Eric, which I didn't know. So that, you know, it just says. And a PUC. And a PUC. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, it just says there is more information to cover, but you got to look for it and you got to have somebody it, that has incentives and, and sort of coming completely, in this case, from the outside California to actually find it and then tell us in California what's going on there. So you just by itself illustrate the information problem. Okay, we'll close right here with the panel, for, uh, sort of all the rounds, and just uh, allow a, a few of you to ask questions. Go ahead and please uh, stand up. Hi there, um, Kathy Astromoff, she, her pronouns, um, ex-Amazon, ex-Apple, sees you, evacuate, third my neighborhood, burn down and sees you. Not pg and &E's fault, and that's probably the nicest thing I'll say about pg and &E. mm -hmm. um, uh, I really appreciate the way you all are beginning to talk about this in terms of risk. I think it's phenomenal. I think the risk transfer in all this has been, I think, the most staggering thing as both a business person and a homeowner kind of dealing with it on the ground. Um, I think uh, there's a risk that you haven't mentioned, but I think you're alluding to already, and you're doing a really good job of making that risk known to regulators and to pg &E, which is pg &E is losing, if it hasn't already completely lost, its social license to operate. Right? Which means that there is no pg and &E customer that sits there and goes, I love pg and &E. I think pg and &E is great. But people hate pg and &E. And where that's manifesting in terms of risk right now is the very vocal and increasingly influential movement to, um, for behind the meter rooftop solar and storage. And uh, which pg and &E and PUC, I guess, is, is hearing them 3.0 right now. And... Um, where PG&E is trying to propose um, a rate plan for people who have solar and storage on their on their houses or on their buildings, um, such that it charges those folks appropriately for the cost of maintaining the grid or of upgrading the grid. Now, I think many people would love to pay uh, for uh, to be part of a network. We all know that a network is only as valuable as the number of nodes in the network. Um, I think people get pretty ill at the idea of paying for a network that's run in the way that PG&E has run it in the, in the last little while. So my, my question to you all, there really is a question, I'm just pontificating. Um, my question to you all is, I'm surprised that you haven't yet brought up um, behind the meter solar and storage. I'm curious to hear what your points of view on that. It obviously doesn't solve the fact that we have to rebuild transmission, right, because everybody should be networked. Um, but I'm curious about imagining what a world looks like where we're dealing with not um, less centralized generation transmitted to lots of people and more networked generation transmitted to lots of people with a lot more central um, sort of always on utilities to because the sun goes down and the wind doesn't blow. So I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, I think you didn't bring it up because I don't think it's central to some of the things. Uh, not, that's not to say it isn't extremely important, and it's part of our overall policy plan in in California. So, um, and I won't go into any detail about NIM 3.0, um, but 
um, it, it is dealing with um, a new model, if you will, uh, of how we as a state um, incentivize um, going forward um, storage, as, I mean, solar plus storage. It's part of, of, of 3.0 in a big way uh, in the state. So um, it's extremely important. It's, it's part of what we have to do to reach our climate goals. And um, how we do it is extremely important. So I don't. I think it was just ignored only because it wasn't central to. to yeah, they didn't come up because I think it was. We comment and then we need to close pretty soon. Um, I guess I have a little bit of a different take. I mean, I just believe that any customer, whether you have so, whether you can afford solar or not, should be able to afford electricity uh, and energy in general. Um, and that's really a central issue of NEM. And I know that it's been framed like, um, like they're cutting solar subsidies. But there is some truth that you know, the more we pay based on, particularly based on rates, um, the more other people have to pay for the infrastructure that goes to their homes. And so it comes down to, you know, um, like I believe that Anybody who doesn't want to put on solar or storage but still wants electricity, that rate should still be affordable. And, and so I think for me that's why it doesn't come up as much. Just to make a final uh, statement, we uh, did not have a representative from pg and &E here, uh, but I did invite, uh, we did invite uh, an executive from pg and &E to be here, and we told them that uh, we will let them speak for a few minutes at the end, not be on a panel. I've been on a panel with people who have a certain view of things, uh, and I wanted only people who have views but don't have uh, built-in potential conflicts. Um, they didn't end up coming, although uh, this the chief financial officer who visited my class last year uh, uh, tried to come at least uh, for the end or for a informal off the record engagement. So, but that's why uh, they're not here and we were, we didn't offend anyone personally by speaking about PG&E the way we, some of us did. Uh, thank you so much for, to everybody for engaging. Thank you for, to this panel. And uh, I think it just meant we have to have more discussions of this. <laughs>